and people are just going to come in and then I will give them a minute to come in a little bit and then I will change the spotlight over to uh, Cassandra to say hello and we'll do that now. Okay, whenever you're ready, Cassandra. Great, so we're all in. Can everybody hear me? Happy to be here, okay, great. Um, so thank you everyone so much for being here today uh, for this workshop. We're gonna be supporting our pollinators and learning how to grow a pollinator garden. Um, my name is Cassandra. I'm the Office of Sustainability in, uh, I am the Sustainability Coordinator in the Office of Sustainability. Some would say I'm the whole office, but I'm not. There's other people working there too. Um, so today we are going to be going through this container gardening workshop, and this is actually an event as part of the Living Planet at Campus program at Concordia, which is a sustainability engagement program that we offer in collaboration with WWF Canada. And so I'd like to encourage everyone, uh, you know, we have a we have a meeting format today. It's not a webinar format. You're not, you don't have to stay hidden if you don't want to. So uh, you can ask your questions in the chat if you feel comfortable doing that. And I'll make sure to ask our, our speakers uh, those questions. Or if you want, you can raise your virtual hand under participants. And I'll keep an eye on that and see if there's anyone who has their hand raised, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself come onto video if you like and ask your question that way. Um, so before we move on, I'd like to start this workshop off uh, in a good way by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands and the Gahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands of Djage, uh, where our team is offering the workshop today. So as we talk about these native plants today, you know, these indigenous plants that have ultimately evolved over thousands of years in this territory, um, you know, we should also be mindful that these plants were present and were used for thousands of years by the Ganyan Gahaga, by other visiting First Nations and are still used today. So it's not something that we're going to be really going into today. Uh, you know, we won't be talking about it, uh, which is perhaps a limitation of this event, but it's definitely worth learning more about and thinking about. And when we give a territorial acknowledgement, we're trying to respect these continued connections with the past, the present, and the future. And so these plants can also be understood as a connection point to the historical and the current stewardship of these lands by our Indigenous uh, communities. So uh, without further ado, then I'll share my screen and we'll get started with a presentation. Let me see. Great, so you should now all be seeing my presentation uh, slide. Um, I'll begin by outlining our collaborators that we have with us today. So major collaborator is the fourth space who is hosting this workshop and, and thank you for space for doing so. Um, we also have myself from the Office of Sustainability. Uh, we have uh, the Concordia Pollinators Initiative. Today we have Faye, Hannah, and potentially also Caleb who are students currently involved in the Concordia Pollinators Initiative. I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves and their initiative in a short while. And then I believe Faye will be staying on for the entire workshop uh, in order to answer your questions if you have any more in-depth questions about pollinators. We also have uh, from the Center for Creative Reuse, Anna Timbotis, uh, Tim Botos, who is the center's founder and project coordinator, and we have Arian Weeks, who is the material and tools literacy coordinator. And so they're here to talk about the materials you can use to create your container garden. And last but certainly not least, we have Andrea Tremblay, who is an indie student um, in the a PhD student in the indie program, and she's also the creator of the Mind Heart Mouth Garden at Loyola Campus. So for several summers, she has tended to this garden to grow delicious and healthy produce, which is then donated to local community groups. So Andrea will be leading the demonstration portion of today's workshop with us. 
So we're going to begin with the introduction to the pollinators. Um, then we're going to talk about the pollinators initiative. The whole presentation is really about pollinators. But then we're going to talk about what are pollinators and why are they important. We'll talk about what a pollinator garden is, the materials that you need to create your own. And then we're going to get our hands dirty with Andrea. We'll move into the demonstration portion of today's workshop. So without further ado, then I will hand it off to Faye, Hannah, you can come on and unmute yourself and uh, just let me know when you want me to change your slide. Sure, thank you so much for that introduction, Cassandra. Um, so I'm Hannah, a member of the Concordia Pollinators Initiative. Um, so our group has been around since about 2017 and we are a student group under the Concordia Food Coalition. Our major kind of goals are to engage the Concordia community and greater community um, in sort of um, yeah supporting the uh, urban pollinators that we have. We really focus on on the uh, lesser known native pollinators here and hoping that through supporting them um, we can also increase uh, urban food security as we are a part of the uh, food coalition. Um, but yeah, you can go to the next slide. So we have two major goals that we use um, in kind of reaching that, fulfilling that mission. And the first is to uh, do that through education. So uh, Faye will talk about our, our kind of current projects, but um, yeah, that, that involves uh, yeah, doing education, helping people understand who the pollinators are, what they're important for, what they do. And the other thing is through actually supporting them. Um, so, you know, planting uh, native flowers and, and doing things like this workshop to make sure that their habitat and food sources are uh, there for them. Go to the next slide. And I think Faye will talk about our projects. Hi, uh, thanks for having us. And we're really excited for this workshop. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we've done so far. And so, yeah, one of our projects is uh, it's continuous. It's just basically providing educational workshops. And in the past, um, they've been mostly in person. Um, the most recent in person one was with the um, Creative Reuse Center uh, last year which was really great. We got to um, talk about pollinators and help people learn how to start seedlings. And um, since then, we haven't really had anything in person because of the pandemic. But um, this year, we're going to be releasing videos, uh, video workshops on how to start seedlings and also upkeep seedlings and how to transplant them, et cetera. Um, in the past, there's also been guerrilla gardening as well, where we made seed bombs and distributed them to uh, volunteers and other students. Uh, basically, you just throw them wherever <laughs> in an empty lot. And yeah, and uh, we're thinking of doing more of that this year as well. We also have a garden plot that was set up in 2019, uh, which is still there. Uh, we're going to plan on um, doing some upkeep this year uh, in the late spring. So like transplanting things, um, replacing things, um, and also just making it look nicer. So also looking for volunteers if they're interested in participating in that uh, over the summer. Uh, we also started a seed library last year uh, where basically the seed library is meant to uh, we dis distribute seeds to people and then once their flowers bloom and they come to seed, they keep some of the seeds for themselves and uh, they return some of the seeds to us. Um, that's been sort of on pause for now because of the pandemic, which is like, it makes it kind of difficult to meet with people. So we'll see how things go. We can continue that um, once the restrictions are lessened. But um, yeah, and this year we did a planting materials giveaway where we basically gave, gave away um, a, a growing bag full of soil and seeds and growing trays for people to take home and start their own seedlings with like five different species of uh, wildflower seeds. And that's been pretty successful. We've had like 60 people sign up for that, uh, which is really great. So like the more people planting, the better. 
And yeah, and we're always looking for volunteers and uh, anyone who wants to participate. We have a Facebook page as well, so uh, you can search for that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Faye and Hannah, for being here and for, for you know, uh, collaborating on this. We encourage absolutely everyone to also sign up for the, or to keep an eye out on Concordia Pollinator Initiative's social media. Sign up for that because they're going to be releasing step-by-step -step videos as well um, as the seasons progress on, on the different things you can do to take care of your pollinator garden. So very much in alignment with what we're doing today. Um, so let's move on to what are pollinators and why they are important. So we, we're all kind of aware of this crisis of the bees and maybe we know what that's all about and maybe we don't. So let's, let's talk about what these pollinators are. So pollinators are essentially their birds, bats, bees, butterflies, beetles, anything with a bee. Um, hummingbirds can be, you know, other small mammals, moths as well. And so what they do is they travel from plant to plant. Uh, and as they do that, they carry pollen on their bodies. So they're taking pollen that was from a male plant and they're transferring that genetic material to a female plant in a reproductive uh, sequence. And so this is a really vital interaction because without pollination, plants they will not uh, seed and they will not fruit. Um, so this is a really important step in the reproductive process of most plants. And so why are they important? Because they sustain our natural ecosystems, they sustain our supply of food, our oils, our fabrics, our fibers, our raw materials, many things that grow on this earth uh, need to be pollinated by these types of species. And pollinators are actually responsible for one of three uh, bites of food that we put in our mouth, it's been estimated. So these are actual pollinators. There are wind pollination, there's fire pollination, there's other things that can happen. But so these animals um, that we're trying to support through these gardens are responsible for one third of the global food supply. Um, they also prevent soil erosion by maintaining these plants and increase carbon sequestration, which is super important as well. And so in Canada, we have over 700 species of pollinators. Uh, with bees being the most common, but we also have butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, beetles, hummingbirds, even certain bats in Canada are pollinators. And in Canada, certain ones of our crops that we specialize in here depend on them. So fruits, those can be uh, berry fruits or they can be tree fruits. Our, our canola, alfalfa, squash, and melon are all pollinated by these insects or birds um, or bats. So then, what is a pollinator garden and why? Well, it's because our pollinators are in decline. So threats to our pollinators can include diseases, viruses, and pests, pesticide exposure from agricultural uh, industrial farming, and most importantly, though, loss of habitat and food sources. And this is where we can come in. We have an imperative to think of our gardens differently. So a nice quote from Doug Tallamy, uh, who began a network of container gardens across America in an effort to create this national park of individual gardens, um, says that in the past, we've asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty, but now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So this is, you know, recognizing that we're kind of in this global emergency where our pollinators are in decline and we have the tools to make a difference and to restore biodiversity one person at a time. Also with larger scale initiatives too, but we're going to we're going to talk more about the one person at a time thing today. Um, so native gardens are important because plants that have uh, historically grown in a specific region have actually evolved and co-evolved with the pollinator species. So this ensures that our pollinators every year have the right type of food and habitat and the timing of food and habitat as well is very important. So they've all like evolved together to come out at the right time to be there for each other when they need it and that keeps the cycle going. And uh, at home pollinator gardens have proven to be very effective in supporting our pollinators. So they've shown that home gardens can and do attract pollinators. 
that suburbs and cities with pollinator gardens can actually have just as diverse or more diverse pollinator communities than surrounding wildlands, um, that pollinators don't seem to be freaked out or phased by city life, they will actually come to the city uh, if there are enough pollinator gardens to draw them. And in fact, if you have a pollinator garden nearby a community garden, it's been shown to increase the agricultural yield of that garden as well. So now that we know why we're doing this, let's talk about what we need to do it. The most important part, of course, is the plants themselves. So we've got the need to plant seeds or sow your seeds, or you could buy seedlings. And today we're going to be talking specifically about how to start from seed. But some people just go out and buy their seedlings already ready, and they can plant those at home as well. And what we're looking for in a seedling for a pollinator garden is native species for the reasons we just discussed, uh, as well as diversity of plants. So this is amazing because different pollinators actually like different things in their plants. Uh, for instance, bees prefer bright yellow, white, or blue plants with a flat, shallow, or a tubular shape. Butterflies look for those same shapes, but they want bright red or purple colors. Beetles will prefer dull colored plants, like what, dull white or dull green with a bowl-like shape. So magnolia flowers are a good example of what a beetle will go for. And birds will prefer shades of red, orange, or white and plants that are shaped like funnels. So this is interesting, right? We have different pollinators going for different things and there's, it doesn't stop there. There's also different preferences for odor, for the location and accessibility of nectar or pollen on the plant and the flowering time. Uh, for instance, moths actually need plants that flower at night because they're nocturnal pollinators. Um, so what you want to do is to create a, a pollinator garden that has different uh, colors, different shapes, and make sure you at least have three or four different species to help attract these, uh, these pollinators. And the next uh, criteria for looking for seeds is that they should be ethically and locally sourced. Um, and normally a company will make this clear either on the seed packet itself or on their website. And the reason this is important is because um, there are companies who will go out and harvest seeds from the wild, but when you remove the seeds, you remove the, um, the potential for regeneration. And often this is even on indigenous lands. So we want to make sure that they're, they're doing so sustainably, that they're, they're harvesting in an ethical way, and also locally, because um, some people can even import seeds that are native plants, but the seeds come from as far away as California. So we want to make sure that we're supporting, um, you know, nurseries that provide uh, ethically sourced and local seeds or seedlings. And finally, you would want your plants to be perennial. Um, perennial simply means that they come back each year. So an annual plant will die every year during the winter, and you'd have to plant it again the following spring. But a perennial plant, uh, given the right conditions and the right protections, their roots will survive the winter and then they will come back in the spring. So the crucial materials that you're going to want to have to create your garden is containers. Um, so this is just the, you know, the, the vessel that you're going to put your soil and your seed into, uh, your potting soil. It's very important to choose potting soil and not garden soil. Garden soil is quite dense and won't drain properly and potting soil allows for proper drainage. So it can be any potting soil, but make sure it says potting soil on the bag, uh, water, of course, and proper sunlight so that your seedlings can grow. And good to have materials are things like popsicle sticks or plastic spoons that you can stick into your soil and just label your seeds so that as they grow, you know which ones they are so you don't forget. Um, fertilizer is good for when your plants come back in the spring uh, to encourage them. Uh, rocks, you can just go out and find a few pebbles, you can find a few rocks anywhere around your home, and those are excellent for putting at the bottom of your uh, final container to promote proper drainage so that your soil is not all matted down at the bottom of your container. It's got like some holes, it's got some, some nice spaces through which the water can flow. A watering can is always nice, um, but not always necessary. You can definitely use any kind of container you have at home and just pour water into your plants. Um, and garden mulch, which you can make your own. It's really easy and we're 
you know, we have guidelines for that, which we're going to share with you. This is to make sure that you want your plant to survive the winter, you're going to have to insulate it at some point in the fall. And um, we can talk about that a bit more and we're going to be sending guidelines, like I said. So I will uh, let Anna and Arian take it away and just talk about the types of materials you can actually make uh, or use that you might have around your home. Hello. Thanks so much for having us. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, we're, um, I guess we could say a little bit about uh, the Center for Creative Reuse that we collect usable materials from on campus um, and then make them available to the Montreal community for free. Unfortunately, our doors have been closed. Actually, I think since the pollinators, I think that was one of our last events last year before we closed the doors. Um, but this has been a good way to sort of reconnect with some of our community members and gather up some materials to send out to you. So, so some of you may have picked up a kit from us downtown in the last couple of days, and it was really nice to see you. Yeah, we'll talk about those in a moment. But first, and, and Cassandra has put on some great examples of things that you can use around the house to turn into um, a place where you can start your seedlings. So some eggshells is a good one if you eat eggs. Um, there's an example of uh, the, uh, the egg cartons. So that's another good one. I've um, also seen um, keeping them together and cutting out the center if you'd like to add more depth because a, a, a container like this is quite shallow, maybe good for the first stage of your seed planting, but it will need to grow into something larger. Another option is to take a uh, milk or milk alternative uh, carton and cut it open. And you can use that as a, as a container to grow your seedlings in. Uh, as, as the toilet paper craze continues, um, you can also use toilet paper rolls by cutting the bottom and creating, uh, creating a bottom like that to start your seedlings in. Um, we managed to gather up some of the last uh, Concordian newspapers and made some of these little newspaper um, seedling containers out of them and then putting them in a styrofoam uh, tray. So a, a good way of reusing a styrofoam tray. Another uh, reusable container to hold your seedlings in as you water them uh, is one of those mushroom containers. You could even plant right in there, but be sure to cut some holes in the bottom. Uh, for drainage. Yeah, we were also talking a little bit about kind of like these plastic clamshells as berry or berry containers. Um, sometimes things come in them um, and they're a good way to um, keep things uh, warm uh, by covering them over in that sort of first stage of, um, of planting. So yeah, lots of options. So if you didn't pick up things from us in person, I'm sure that you can look in around your house and find things to plant in. We're sort of looking for three stages, this initial kind of tray, a smaller one to grow into the next uh, and a little bit bigger. And then it's final planting space that will be out on, um, out on your balcony or outdoors. And if you go to the next slide, Cassandra will show. Um, so for those of you, there was some of you that signed up, I think about 20 of you or so, uh, signed up to get some containers from us. So you'll see in the bottom uh, right corner, these uh, old garbage cans that we no longer use on campus. We've uh, developed this sort of low waste office uh, setup uh, across campus. And so now we have actually hundreds of these old garbage cans. And so we decided to use that as the final planter uh, for putting your seedlings in once they've grown up a bit. And then we collected a bunch of um, pot, the plastic pots to serve as that second stage. And then we, uh, there was some peat pots um, that we had as well. So um, we also used some old CD cases, uh, CD little paper envelopes to put all your seeds in. Uh, to get you going. Yeah. So yeah, we're hoping that those uh, that you those of you that picked up kits are, are able to use those well. Um, and uh, just to, to think about what you have around the house to get you started in, in your seedlings. Yeah. Good for us. Sorry, my unmute button kept disappearing. That's perfect. Thank you both so much. 
So yeah, there's lots of different ways you can kind of uh, create your pollinator garden without necessarily having to buy things new. Um, the materials they talked about that we gave out were, these are the starter containers. We had these or a plastic version, a four inch diameter was the um, seeding container. So you'd be transplanting here when they get a little bit bigger and stronger. And then the garbage, was, <laughs> the, garbage the bin, um, you know, was for that final stage where you actually would take all your different species and put them together in one beautiful uh, container uh, garden. And so if any of you were wondering what happened to your office bin, if any of you are staff and wondering what happened when they removed all our bins, now you know where they ended up. And um, as they said, we've provided seeds in these uh, repurposed uh, packets, which used to be just regular CD ROM slip covers. You're going to want to probably take a sharp knife uh, when it's time and kind of slit open the sides maybe uh, that might be the best way to actually access all the seeds that are in there because there's a bit of a static um, that's occurring with the seeds and they're, they're clinging to that plastic uh, film. So you might want to just open it up, make sure you have access to all your seeds in there. Um, so we'll move on to the seeds that we did provide. And I think Andrea might want to bring us through each of the types of seeds we'll be uh, working with today. But I'd like to emphasize that if you didn't pick up materials or if you don't want to work with these particular seeds, that's perfectly all right. You can, you can choose any pollinator species you like. And uh, I keep mentioning these guidelines. I'll put them in the chat very soon. You can uh, follow those guidelines on planting your own garden with whatever species that you like. But uh, for the purpose of today, with the demonstration, we'll be talking about the four that we uh, collected and that we gave away. So Andrea, if you're, if you're ready, you can take it away. I see that you're outside. It might be a little windy when you talk, so try to talk loud if you can. Yeah, I realize it's windy. I'm a little concerned about those tiny little seeds actually, but we will see what happens. Um, so hi everybody. So I have here all my materials. I did cut the smaller containers um, just for my purpose. I prefer working with individual uh, containers. I have my bigger containers. I have my seeds. I have not a spoon, but I have a fork with a sticker uh, ready to uh, label my seeds. Um, what else do I have? I have a stage two seedling uh, ready for the, the next step. Um, so without further ado, I think I will start. Um, so we will start, um, as Cassandra mentioned, um, you need to make sure that uh, the soil that you have is um, potting soil or what I have is also called seedling soil, which is a lighter, uh, more airy uh, soil. Um, just one second. There we go. Um, so we will, I'll fill these up. Start with three of them. So I will leave the soil quite light. I don't want to press too much. I'll just press a little bit. I think from my experience, it's easier for the, the roots um, to pierce through. And so this is the first step. Um, and I will start with Aster. Um, I just wanna make sure I have my, okay. So Aster, they're all very, very tiny seeds. So, um, I will try and get them inside my hand. They're not coming out. Ugh. It's that static cling. Yeah. Um, so I'll maybe I'll just try and slide them with the knife. Yeah, they're coming out. <laughs> There we go. I'll use this container. 
I also want to say it probably looks like the smallest amount of seeds. I'm sure when people received these, they were like, why would you give me such a small amount of seeds? But rest <laughs> assured, these are the correct seeds, uh, number of seeds to start in that sized uh, container. And this is an experiment, right? This is just so you can experiment with your, your different uh, capacities for, for making a pollinator garden. Okay. And later, if you really like it, you can buy a whole pack and you get over a thousand of them. <laughs> so hopefully these will work out for you. Okay, so I, I think the best way uh, would be to try and pour these in a little bowl if you wanna be able to see your seeds. Um, so, and then, then to put them, uh, sprinkle them on top of the soil, just like so. Um, you don't really need to, to dig holes for these because these seeds are so small. You may want to just sprinkle a little soil like so on them. And then I would put them in here. I'll water everything at the end. And then you move on to the second seed. I'll do the same thing because that seemed to have worked uh, pretty well. Put it in the container first. These are a bit bigger. So it's easier when they're bigger. I'm also just going to share the, the file in the chat. It's a it's a Google Drive uh, document and anyone can download this. It's got the steps that Andrea is bringing us through today. Uh, so if you want to revisit these steps, you can use the document. You can also, of course, view the workshop again. We'll be putting it up online. Um, so it's up to you. So you've got some guidelines to follow as well. Right. So this is primrose. Again, tiny little seeds. I'm going to put them, just sprinkle them on top of here on the so in the soil. Just tap a little. Um, actually, one thing I would say is to label things as you go. <laughs> so this way, um, it's it's less confusing. So the first one I did was um, Aster. Aster. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think my slides are still showing. Are they not? Okay. So that's okay. But I'll give some information. Victorin's uh, evening primrose flowers from July to September. It will grow from a height to 0.65 to 1.25 meters. And it's an evening primrose, so it flowers in the evening and it attracts those nocturnal pollinators like moths. So it's a lovely thing to add to your pollinator garden. As you can see, they're very sticky. The static is, is really powerful. Which, which one is this now? I'm sorry. Uh, this is the reed grass. Great. So the reason we wanted to include a grass was because it uh, doesn't provide food for the pollinators. Grasses are normally pollinated by wind actually, or this one is, um, but it provides habitat. So you might actually get um, pollinators laying their, their eggs uh, as well. Caterpillar and pupae may overwinter in this grass. So it's always nice to have a, a nice grassy part of your garden to kind of give the habitat requirements for your for your species. And these ones, how are they coming out, Andrea? It <laughs> does not want to. <laughs> I got yes. it. I got it. Okay. They're so small and kind of feathery. So the static cling is just like very powerful. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I could see the benefit. Uh, one of the suggestions was to uh, use talcum powder um to, to to i guess massage or mix with the seeds and i think that might have helped in this process of uh getting them unstuck otherwise i think these you could even see here on top of the soil um and these also um do not need to be covered because they need light um to germinate but they also need water so here's my little handy dandy seedling watering can um and so we'll make it a nice moist soil, but without uh, making it soggy. Yeah, the first time I think, Andrea, you wanna water more 
and then later on it's just maintenance correct yeah yeah because especially the soil i used was was a bit dry it's been sitting since i sitting there since i planted my seedlings for the mind heart mouth garden a few weeks ago so it, it's a bit dry so i mean one thing you could do is uh, put water in the soil first so you have a soil that's already moist that's mm -hmm. all good uh, or you could just do it this way. Um, you might also want to put your little um, seedling containers inside a container like this, a larger container. Um, so this way like it keeps the moisture in as well. So when your when your plants, when your flowers have grown to about this much, um, I will remove this one for that. So you're also going to want to keep these warm. So preferably in the house, if you have grow lights, they could even grow under a grow light. If you have a smaller container, you could use put something like this. You could use these as planters, but you could also use them uh, to keep your moisture and the warmth inside. So um, like a little greenhouse. Yes. Yeah. So that always helps the seedlings. So I will not do it here right now, but um, so that would be one way to proceed. The um, last seed we have is a bit of a, a kind of surprise um, seed. This one needs a special treatment. This one is the golden golden rod. So the golden rod needs to be to, needs a cold treatment to germinate. So you could would be the recommended process is to put them in a Ziploc or any kind of sealed container. I prefer using uh, this sort of container. And you put it with um, vermic vermiculite. Uh, so you could purchase that, or I think Cassandra said there's a, a recipe to make your own. They just say you could use fine sand. So you just okay. go to the park and you scoop uh, okay. sand. I, I happen to have a little bit of sand here that, um, but the the thing is that it's it's supposed to be about the same quantity of sand as the amount of seeds you have so you don't need a lot um i mean for this quantity particularly so i would i would put a small amount and then somehow <laughs> get the seeds out um, Right, so we had three types of seeds that will germinate properly uh, without a special uh, without special exposure to cold, but these last seeds, the Canada goldenrod, will require some cold before they germinate. And so what we're recommending here and what Andrea is doing is to actually mix it with sand and then you'll put it in your refrigerator for 30 to 60 days. And for all of you who prefer a more natural process, what you could also do is simply take the seeds and put them on your soil in the fall, in the winter, because they'll get their cold requirements over the winter and then they'll germinate over the winter and they'll grow in the spring. But we are in a rush. So we are uh, wanting to put them in our refrigerator so they germinate. And then when we plant all of our uh, plants in our big container garden, we'll have our germinated uh, goldenrod seeds that we can sprinkle in there too. So this is kind of, this is how you would do it. Um, the container could go in the fridge. Um, just maybe uh, I would recommend to label it, <laughs> especially if you don't live alone. Uh, and also uh, label it with a date at, you know, the date that they're ready to be planted. That might be a good idea as well. Um, so, so that's for our, those seeds. So now when your seedlings, uh, the first three we did, this is a kale seedling uh, that I have ready for the garden, but we, for the purpose of this demonstration, I will um, show you how you then plant this into a bigger container. The purpose of doing that is that um, to grow stronger roots as every time like the roots, the, the, the roots will go grow as much as the container. So um, you want to have a strong, a stronger uh, root system before you plant, plant it in the larger container. So once I plant this in here, the roots will fill and the, so the plant will be stronger by the time you're ready to put it outside uh, in your garden. 
So how you will do that is you will take your little container again, um, put some soil in it, just uh, enough so that this will go over. So that's a little bit too much. You could have also like a, something that's slightly bigger, that's fine too. So once this is in here, you want to put the soil um, around it. You could also put some um, fertilizer, like vermicompost at this stage that it would be good for it to add that to your soil before you do this. I know, Andrea, the first time I transplanted something, I was quite afraid of damaging the plant. Like, how how delicate are the roots of these plants as we're, as we're transplanting them? Is there anything we need to keep in mind? Well, one of the reasons for doing it from container to container is actually to protect the roots. Like, there are uh, some root systems that are very fragile, so you don't want to you don't want to start playing with them um, too much. So one good way to do that is to have these containers because these are uh, um, biodegradable. And so they will, the, the roots, once they're in the soil, they will start decomposing and the roots will just go through, grow through them. Um, so once you do that, the same process, you don't need to cover it, but you'll need to water it well again. Um, I like not to, because this one is pretty fragile, I'm trying not to put water on the leaves so much uh, just yet. So you would do that like that. You Again, the first, when you transplant it like that, you're, you could be quite generous. Uh, one of the ways actually for these containers to know is that you start, um, the container starts showing when it's damp. So. It, it's easy to know um, when it's got enough water if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. So um, so you wait a couple more weeks. Uh, and then when, uh, I guess in at the end of May, beginning of June, um, you could move to the big container. So the way you'll prepare. Uh, just, sorry, just a question, Andrea, before we move on to the big finale of the container. I'm sure. wondering, we had these peat pots uh, that you're demonstrating with, but if people had plastic pots instead, they yeah. would have to actually remove yeah. the entire clump of soil and, and do the transplant that way, correct? Yeah, yeah. So in that case, you would be touching the roots, I guess, or not necessarily, you don't have to touch the root, but you would be doing it the same way. You would fill up your container with soil. Uh, you would very gently um, maybe pour it out uh, and then try to put it here without squeezing the roots or the stems. Some, it depends on which plants. Some plants it's better to just take them by the stem and move them. Uh, others, I think it's always safe to just like to try and transfer it very gently without touching uh, too much. Like if you could for your container and the plant comes out in your hand and then you could transfer it uh, immediately into your container. That's probably what I would suggest that for that method. And we want to make sure too that the containers we're using have drainage holes. So whether oh, they're the, the yeah. plastic ones or whether they're the peat ones, punch yeah. a few holes. If you're using a yogurt container, you're going to want to make sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Which and, is my, sorry. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, I don't know if you could see. Uh, if you don't have, if you didn't pick up the package. Um, so we're using these great, I think they make great uh, flower pots uh, for a balcony. Uh, my cameraman said that uh, they're actually excited about decorating these. Uh, I think it's also fantastic to do that. Uh, so, but, um, so we've punctured holes with a drill. It's the easiest way I've found. Uh, you take a drill, you put the holes, you need to have enough holes um, to uh, put a wa extra water to evacuate uniformly. Um, so because this container is pretty deep, um, we decided to uh, put some rocks at the bottom to 
so that it won't be too compacted at the bottom, uh, the soil that is. So I picked up these rocks, they're pretty big. <laughs> you could use smaller rocks as well. I kind of went along the road and, and yeah. So I'm just gonna put them at the bottom. You can make it here. Uh, different sizes, and I'll just put the rocks in. I, mean, I didn't bother cleaning these rocks, it's just because with soil, and, and I mean, you could also clean them. Um, I didn't quite see a purpose to that, but yeah. So, and it does, it's not, there's no, um, as far as I know, there's no perfect science to this. So I'll just put all the rocks I found. So this way, uh, even with the soil on top, the extra water will be able to circulate at the bottom. And um, instead of like accumulated in the dense uh, soil, uh, it will go through. So then you would put your soil. It's gonna take a minute. Um, we have doggies, we hope they don't see it. Okay. So as you can see, we can use, we can use uh, quite a bit of soil for this. It doesn't have to be filled uh, to the top. Because uh, don't forget that when you water, as you can see how light the soil is, it's very, very light. Not like if you go in your backyard and start digging or in a backyard. We've got a comment from a participant, Andrea, who's really enjoying your demonstration so far and is also wondering if, if they have questions as they're doing this on their own, uh, would they be able to contact you? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's, I have a Facebook page for Mindheart Mouth. I also have an Instagram, um, Mindheart Mouth. Uh, and I always answer uh, um, questions and people contacting me. I'm also going to be looking for volunteers, hopefully, in a couple weeks. Um, when, when we start. So, yeah, I'm absolutely happy. Or even, you know, people come by the garden and then we could totally chat and answer questions and even experiment on stuff, planting stuff. <laughs> okay, so once your container is like that and this little plant has grown a little more than this, I maybe I think we had a measurement of about 10 centimeters for uh, aster. Um, so I think those, the measurements are in that one page, uh, are, aren't they not, uh, Cassandra? The, the height of the flower? Yeah. Okay. So once this, this one is a little small, but just for the purpose of demonstration, so you will have your four or three different kinds. So you could plant them, you could, however you want. Um, but you have the pictures and you could either create a, a model or you could just you dig a hole like so. And, and you will put this in. Like that. And for a plastic container, again, you'd have to remove the whole, the whole uh, roots and soil and you'd put that into the, the container. But these peat containers are good in that you can just transplant them directly. Ah, yeah. So this, it kind of looks like this. And again, always when you're moving, transplanting, you'll want to water, want to help those roots. Uh, in this one, there isn't too much trauma, but specifically like if you're using a plastic container with the holes, you're going to want to really water it well to, to, uh, to make sure they're happy in there and in their new environment. I never personally tap the soil too much. Uh, in this case, with the container, you 
don't need to because it's already in there, it's protected. I just kind of tap the soil a little bit around it. But as you could see, it's very light. The soil is like I could, if I was to press it, like I could down a, go down a lot. But I don't really want to do that. I prefer a lighter soil. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. So if we do this uh, with the three potted species, uh, seeds that we're going to be growing, uh, where does the germinated goldenrod seed come in? Right. So that's kind of fun. You could, you could plant them separately in a separate container. But what would be fun, I think, is if you, you know, you have your, your three things already and you could say, let's say I plant seeds like that. I mean, I'm not planting them right now, but and then you save a corner for your goldenrod and then you could sprinkle that there and then you'll have your four different kinds in the same container. And that could be very beautiful. You could also, if you look at the, the different heights of the flowers, depending on where your container is gonna be positioned, you may wanna have uh, the taller one at the back and the, the shorter ones at the front or vice versa or however you like them, you know? Or you could, you know, not try and control and you could just like say, okay, just grow and have a nice like kind of uh, uh, wild flower field kind of feeling. Uh, so there's that too that you could do, I guess. Um, it's, probably, it's probably true too, that if we try to put a certain order by the second year when they start seeding themselves, <laughs> they're gonna be probably popping up all over the place. We didn't talk about um, sun. So, so for instance, when your seedlings start growing uh, in indoors, because it's a bit too cold right now for seeds um, to stay outside, you do need some sun. So it's either you have a sunny window, which is sometimes tricky because windows are often right above a heater. So that may be drying for the soil. So you need to be careful with that. Make sure your soil is nice and moist. Uh, also, um, for flowers is a bit different. For vegetables, you do need a good six to seven hours of continuous sun. So for flowers, it's a bit different. You may not need as much sun, but they still need a decent amount of sun. Uh, in my house, for instance, I don't have a window where I have that much sun. So I got a couple of grow lights. They sell now. They sell them online. They sell them uh, at any uh, pepiniere, you know, like where they sell plant stuff, Home Depot. Um, yeah, they, they sell them everywhere. It might it's good if you like to do this kind of thing. It's probably good to invest in, in a in a good grow light light. Um, they range from 20 to like obviously like they could go expensive. You have some that have three lights wide, you know, you some are longer. So I mean you could also have just a lamp that has a uh, so there's options uh, for all budgets, I suppose. So it's going it's to be important to be able to offer, make sure that your seedling has sun daily. So that's very important. And when you move them outside, these, the, these specific seeds that we have also need some sun. So you need to find a spot either on your balcony or, or if it's in a yard where they will get some sun throughout the day. Um, that ties in really nicely to a question we just got in the chat where uh, one person participant is saying, which of these plants will thrive best in shade or extreme afternoon heat? So it's looking like this person doesn't have the happy medium of maybe like a partially shaded indirect light situation. They're either in the shade or they're in like the intense sun. What would you recommend in a situation like that? Well, like I would, if I, I would have to see it, I guess. But um, if there's a lot of sun if, and you could put it um, like next to a bigger plant that does like a lot of sun. So this way you're offering partial shade, right? Or you're offering moments of shade where it's, it's in the sun, but not the entire three, four hours of time that the sun is there. So that's one thing I would do. Uh, that's something like you do in the garden. If you have vegetables that need a lot of sun, you'll put them in a prominent place. And those that need less sun, you'll put them sort of in between. Um, so that the bigger ones shade, or the ones that need more sun uh, shade, the ones that need less. Um, 
And, but if you don't have sun, I mean, I have in my house, like I said, I don't actually have a window where there's sun for any, like more than 15, 20 minutes throughout the day. There's three trees all around my house. So, um, so it's not, so I have grow lights. I bought little grow lights. And so I do have pretty plants in my windows, but not because of the sun that they're getting from the real sun, but because of the grow light. It's, it's my, my, my situation. And so I'm trying to make the best um, for that. Yeah. If you wanted to have it outside, I would probably do the same thing. If it's something is just in the shade, needs a light, uh, I would try it. I've never tried it to have a grow light outside, but I would probably try it like just as an experiment. I mean, you lose nothing <laughs> like if that's the only spot you have. That's a good point. Um, and now thinking about that moment or those moments between the point where we're growing it in our windowsill, in our pots indoors to when we put it outside, <clears throat> there's this process that needs to happen, right? And they call it hardening off. So could you talk a little bit about that and, and what needs to be done and kind of why it needs to be done? Um, yeah, so once your, your seedlings have grown and um, either you've get, grown them with grow lights or you've grown them with you know, partial sun that comes through a window, which is part, partially uh, filtered. Um, it's still sunlight, but it's partially filtered. So the, the seedlings are not accustomed to the full force of the, the real sun. So you need, to, you need to accustom them like gradually to that. So you're not going to take your seedlings the first time, like at noon, put them in the sun, and say, okay, have fun all afternoon. They're gonna be probably dead by the time, like within a couple of hours. So what you'll do is you'll do that gradually. You may want to use the morning sun or a late afternoon sun and you'll do it gradually. So at first you'll do, I don't know, like eight o'clock to nine o'clock in the sun and bring them back to their regular spots where they are usually. Um, so yeah. That's what you would do. And you do, it, it's a bit, it's not really time consuming. Uh, depends on your setting. You could also, what I've done here, because I have this back porch, is that um, I will put it out like at 8 a.m. where there's some sun, but it's pretty shady by nine. So like there, it's, it's by nine o'clock, it could, if it's a nice warm day, it could stay outside. It's no longer in the full sun. Um, so that worked for me uh, as well. So that those are two options of, I'm open to other suggestions as well. But. On my end, a good reminder will probably be every time my cat uh, wants to go outside <laughs> is usually the time of day that a plant would also want to be outside just for the yeah. beginning. Um, and then the idea being, of course, that you could do this for longer and longer periods, right? Until it's able right. to survive overnight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So gradually the next day you do a little longer. Uh, of course, we don't have sun every day. I, we do this week, but we're very lucky. But so um, I would also not throw them in the full rain, like if it's supposed to rain uh, in a few days. Um, it's going to be like at this time of the year, it's also cool to rain. So I would wait for that. I would, you yeah. know, just everything gradual, like just, you know, the first time, maybe an hour, the second time, and they keep gradually two hours. If it did well, if you see that it looks like maybe the hour even was too much, like, okay, so like, just take it easier. Like it, you will have to um, adjust, but even if it looks good after an hour, I would, the first time I would remove it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's, an after effect, like you, you leave it there for a little longer, a little too long, I mean, and then you bring it in and it's, it's, that's when it decides to shrivel. The reaction is like, uh, just, I don't know. And you would definitely want to wait until your plants are planted into the, the bigger size container yeah. and until they're pretty strong looking to start yeah. putting them outside. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're fragile. They're not that fragile, but they're fragile enough that you know you, you take care of them <laughs> yeah for sure and we had a good uh suggestion Faye from the pollinators initiative said sometimes she puts foil around the plants and it increases the reflection of the sunlight onto the plants in low light conditions 
indoors. Yeah, indoors, yeah. Yes. So yes, that's, that's a great suggestion. Good suggestion too. Okay, so was there anything else, Andrea? Do we want to open it up to questions? Um, was there anything that you particularly wanted to tell us before we move into more of a discussion? No, I think, I think, I mean, unless I'm open to questions and if anything, if I forgot anything, I'm hoping it will come uh, during the question or to the question. I'm sure, I'm sure it will. And uh, Faye is still with us too. So if there's anything, Faye, that you particularly want our audience to know about planting these pollinator species, you can definitely come in as well. I would add, if, uh, if anything, that you're sending instructions, right, mm -hmm. about uh, how to fertilize and how to um, uh, like the continuing continuous um, pairing for these plants as well. So, so if people are concerned about that, there will be instructions coming. Yes, I'll post those again. Um, absolutely. So what we've shown here today is the moment from you plant your seeds to when you put it into your big planter and then how you take care of that. But it continues, right, if you want your plants to come back next year. So, Andrea, you can even go over those steps, too, if, if you like, if you think people, uh, it's definitely important. So it doesn't end when you when you just put your plants in the planter. Well, if you let it go to flower, um, obviously, which you probably will because they're flowers, I'm thinking uh, vegetables. <laughs> so when the flower, um, when they're pollinated and the seeds uh, also go flying, you may end up with flower the same, these flowers growing elsewhere the next year. So that could be fun too. Or you could, if you know how to preserve seeds, you could collect more of those seeds and then do that yourself for the following year, preserve those seeds and then just have more containers um, yet yeah, in the next year. That's right. So then the choice is you either let the plant dry out in the fall and drop its seeds into the into the soil that it's already in and it'll grow more next year, or you could find out how to collect them and use them for a different container. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's yeah. wonderful. Uh, you could technically bring this container indoors. Uh, if you have a cold room basement space and um, Without letting it letting it dry completely, you could uh, just keep the soil uh, for the winter, or you could probably like if you have a place outside. If you plant it in the ground, then you could cover the ground with uh, um, mulch or yeah, or mulch. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sorry, um, or yeah, and then then it, it will help help it not to. Uh, to, you know, to keep it warm and protect it a little, protect it a little bit for the winter. And when, when could we expect, uh, let's say it's springtime, it's March, maybe going on April and it still looks really sad. It looks like it died. You don't know if it survived. Like when can we expect them to start growing their flowers again or their leaves, their buds, so that we know that they made it and we can expect them to flower? Well, that depends on the plant. Uh, they all have different calendars. Um, so if you look these up, you will have like a different time. Some of them, as soon as the soil thaws, um, they, they will start sprouting. Um, and, but others may take a little longer. Um, like I have some, uh, in, in the front of my house, I have some, uh, uh, lavender that absolutely looks dead right now. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm just hoping that it will grow, that it will come out. Uh, you know, it. They each have their own time. Like you may have, uh, have I forget what they're called. They're little purple flowers. There, it's a carpet of purple flower now. And, and crocuses. Yes, thank you. Yeah, those are everywhere. Yeah, so those are early bloomers. You know, so each type of flower has their own calendar agenda. So. Um, if you if you you have to look to at each of these seeds that we use today to uh, see which ones you can expect to grow like just even start sprouting these will flower at different times we put that in the slides yeah do you want yeah. me to go to those slides yeah please uh, okay 
let me get that uh, up because yeah we didn't really get a chance to to go through them too much and to show them to show what people are gonna see when they right. actually flower so let me um let me do that right now yeah maybe while i'm doing that i'll take this opportunity to plug another uh living planet at campus activity that we're doing right now called an urban biodiversity scavenger hunt and when andrea mentioned um the crocuses, it reminded me that that's one of the species we have on our scavenger hunt list. So we're, we're kind of encouraging people to get to know the species around Montreal by looking for them, taking photos of them and, and um, putting those on social media with the hashtag see you grow. And we're going to have prizes, really cool prizes for the winners. And so far, too, not too many people are participating. Um, so we definitely want to encourage it because the weather's turning super nice and we want to be able to go outside and kind of see what's around us. So take a look uh, if you're interested at the web page that I just put in the chat. If you want to take part in the urban biodiversity scavenger hunt that's happening right now. And here we are. Here's our first, uh, here's our first seed species, the New England aster. Can you see that, Andrea? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, let me share. My sharing didn't happen correctly. I have, I have the slides on my end. No, it's, it's my sharing. Just let me, let me try this again. There you go. Share screen. Screen two. You seeing this now? Uh, yes. Thank you. There you are. So yeah, you were mentioning the flowering seasons are different for each species. So that was the first seed we did. That's the aster, New England aster. So the flowering season is July to October. So by the time you um, plant that particular um, seedling outside uh, in June, I would say, I would think it won't have flowers yet. So don't just despair. <laughs> it should come uh, by July at some point and uh, they will last until October. So that's like, that's amazing. Um, that's something I would want more of a flower that <laughs> lasts the whole season. Yeah, absolutely. And so like Andrew was saying, if you want to plant it so that your taller ones are in back and your shorter ones are in front, I think these ones are actually one of the shorter ones with a, a, the height of 0.5 up to one meter. Obviously this is after a few seasons of growth, probably not, not your first year. Um, and the aster will attract bees, butterflies, and flies to your garden. <laughs> The next one was the evening primrose. Yeah, so this one also July to September. So the same thing, you'll plant it uh, outside in your bigger container uh, in sometime in June, probably early June. And by July, you'll start having flowers. This one will stop flowering a, uh, a little earlier, September. And it's a bit taller than the other one. Uh, so if you're, if you're doing like a, a display, you may want to plant this one behind um, your aster uh, flower. Yeah, and like we said, it's an evening primrose, which flowers in the evening to attract those moths, which is so lovely to think that we have these different species that we can use to, to feed our pollinators at different times of day. That's really cool. <laughs> Canada reed grass uh, flowering season again July. This one uh, stops flowering a little earlier in August, uh, about the same size as uh, the previous one. So um, again, if you're working on displays, you may want to just put it uh, either next to it or behind. I mean, this is a nice grass, so it quite could be quite decorative too. Um, yeah. 1.5 to 1, 1.25 to 1.5 meters. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and like we said, you won't really expect your pollinators to feed on your grass, even when it's in flower, but they might end up using it for habitat to nestle in and keep safe. So it's always worth keeping a grass in your mix. The goldenrod, or your friend is going to be in the fridge. Um, so by June is going to be, yeah, it's going to be a good time June to plant this one outside. So the same thing, it will grow and by July, you'll, it will also bring the flowers like at the same time as your other one. 
that would be quite lovely. This one is a bit shorter, uh, potentially. So it has 0.6 to 1.5 meters uh, tall. So again, mix it up. Uh, that's what I would do. Um, yeah, and it brings in butterflies and bees. I think this this one is also a bit more um, uh, width uh, from mm -hmm. what I know. So yeah, you may want to put it maybe in the middle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. We didn't include the the uh, full width, but I actually forgot to include the links to each of the C types in the guidelines. So I'll make sure to include the links to those uh, when we email registration registrants after this, um, because there's you know that full table uh, that comes with the C packet, which will actually tell you like the width you can expect and a little bit more information about the shading requirements. But what we tried to do with these four species was to choose ones that had similar uh, soil requirements, watering requirements requirements and shading requirements so that they could live together in the same container and all and all kind of need the same thing. Um, yeah, so that's it for the goldenrod. So if all of you who did collect seeds and you're looking at these goldenrod seeds, your next task is to find some sand or some vermiculite. Is that how you called it, Andrea? Yeah. And to mix it up and put it in your fridge. And I think also uh, it's good to make sure it doesn't dry out in its time in the fridge. Yeah. That's why the sand, uh, um, when you put it in, the sand had to be a bit moist, like not dripping with water, but a little moisture. <laughs> Amazing. I love that you just have a box of sand just ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't ask. <laughs> that, was, that was a whole other presentation. And you had this giant rock that <laughs> you find it. But it's fun too, because some of these materials you can make, like what uh, the Center for Creative Use was telling us, but some of them you could find. So like to get with your kiddos or just go out and find a few rocks, find some sand and to use that in your planting uh, can be quite fun. That's what I did. I was on my walk with the dogs and I said, oh, let's get some rocks. So it's a little heavy to walk up with a backpack of rocks, but. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could take just a few each time so that it works too. Yes. So I'm wondering, is there anyone out there who's watching who has questions who, you know, you could put those questions in the chat um, or you could uh, just raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and ask Andrea your questions. We also have Faye, again, the pollinator expert here with us today. So now's the time because the recording will be available to you later, but we're only here right now, which is not true. You can also still email your questions, like Andrea said, <laughs> or go onto her Facebook. So there's time, but. I see some people wanted to know um, in the chat, they wanted to know if uh, they could get the materials later on. Was that answered or like, did I miss that? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Anna and Arian, uh, who are the keepers of the materials right now, shared their email address. So I'll maybe repost that so that people watching right now can can get that. And if you didn't avail of these materials before, but you still are interested, um, you can get in touch with them because we did have some extra. We prepared for 50 and I think 20 people ended up actually making use of it. Um, so I'll put that. But that is a great question. Uh, we've got a few others coming in here. We got someone who just said it's great, thanks. So that's a wonderful comment. Um, and someone's wondering, what's the best place to actually find your soil? Is there any special requirements or any special place that we should look for soil? I am a little partial uh, for that because I get most of my supplies from urban seedling. Uh, they've just been beyond amazing for uh, the Mine Heart Mouse Garden in terms of supplies, advice, help, answering my panic calls. You know, I have this kind of bug, what do I do? Or this is happening and I don't know how to describe it. Sending pictures, they've been amazing, like beyond. Um, so I am a bit partial. They do also at some point in the summer, um, they have like a compost giveaway um and so that's also fun and well <laughs> if you like to pick up compost um but i think for gardeners it's a fun thing um yeah and so they're they're just amazing and so they, their website they, you could go on their website um when i'm stuck i go to uh you know home depot Renault depot anywhere where they sell soil Canadian so I've got, tire. 
Yeah, yeah, like garden centers. Um, there was a place in Saint Laurent last year, a Pépinière Jasmin, are amazing as well. A little more costly maybe, but they have everything. Like they have everything. Um, la, la, la shop agricole uh, is uh, in Longueuil, a little far, but they do deliver, I think, if, uh, or send, like it, it, they will ship it to you. Um, so they all have great quality soil and all these, if you go to specialist stores like that, um, for me, the advantage is I, I ask questions. I ask lots of questions um, about the soil, about everything I buy. Like I just, I like to, to know what I'm buying and I like to know like the extent of how and why you should use any particular product. So yeah, but I, I do believe that quality soil is important. Uh, you want nutrients in your soil. Uh, like even if like the potting soil is good soil, it's just sometimes it's been, uh, the bags may have been sitting there a long time, so it may be dry, so it may need to be uh, watered a little bit before you use it. Um, yeah, where if you buy a soil like an urban seedling, they literally do their own mix. They, they'll they put a part, uh, it's part, one part soil, one part uh, coconut uh, shreddings uh, to make it light and one part compost. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it's a it's their own soil. Uh, Pépinière Jasmin has their own mix. So each, depending on what you're doing, but a good quality soil, I believe, is very important just for even for your own health. Like you're, if you're going to be playing in the soil, you're going to have that around your house. It should be uh, um, organic or, you know, in, it should be a healthy soil. Okay. Organic meaning that there's no uh, insecticides or pesticides mixed um, in. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 That's great. Could you just list the third one? You, I've uh, put the links for Urban Seedling and uh, Pépinière Jasmin. Uh, what was that third one you mentioned? For La Shop Agricole. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I'll put that in the chat too. Thanks. And we've got another question here. Do you recommend reed grass on a balcony or will it be too big and large? Uh, it, it depends on your balcony, I guess. Um, I think it could be nice and decorative. I mean, you could, uh, you could probably have it just in like fill up this whole container, a container that size, and let it um, expand, like spread in it. You know, I think that could be very pretty. Uh, so yeah, or if you plant it, if you plant all the species we we worked with today in this container, you might want to control it. So you might want, you know remove like if it starts spreading you might want to cut it uh trim it a little bit so but that, that's up to you you know or you could technically you could plant each of these or these rather and and, and other each their pot you may like depends on the space you have really and the purpose you want to do yeah and we should keep in mind that the uh, height indicators uh are often for people who are planting these in their gardens uh so I, I don't imagine that we're going to get the full height plants as as we would because it also depends on on how much the roots are allowed to expand. So um, I am not, you know what? Let's take a chance. I'm sure it's not going to be too big for a balcony. It's going to be great. I agree. I agree. I mean, and if you know what, if it becomes too big, you could move it to another container. You could move it somewhere else if you want to. You know, um, yeah. it's just, it's just you have to have fun with this. You know, that's my. My on it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we also have someone asking where they can get the seeds. Um, so you just listed some great places that I'm sure they have great seeds too. I'll put in the link to the um, the nursery where we procure the seeds for our giveaway. It's Ailon Indigo. They're uh, out, based right outside Montreal and they uh, have very good practices for their seeds and their seeds are just lovely. Um, I don't have much experience with seeds, so maybe I'm biased, but I think they're lovely. And I'll put, yeah, I've just put the link in the chat to them and also just put the link right now to each of the four species that we gave out. So I'll just get busy doing that. In the meantime, we have uh, someone in the audience who's asking, I have a very windy balcony. So should they have some kind of wind block? Do they need uh, some kind of protector for their, for their plants? 
um, again, I would experiment. I mean, I would probably start it with something to, to, uh, to um, make, make it less windy for the, the plant. You could find a pretty, either a board or a piece of fabric that, um, you know, that may look nice as well, you know? Um, so yeah, I would, I would protect it probably at first. And then, you know, you could try and expose it as it, as it gets stronger throughout the summer, I think it will, you know, then you would maybe take a chance and uh, expose it. Mm. Yeah, and we have Faye uh, mentioning that fabric or screen would be great, but sometimes something that's kind of sheer and does let sunlight through. Oh yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a good point too. I was also wondering if Faye maybe has ideas for people to get a native uh, space. Oh yeah, um, the ones that you mentioned were yeah some of the places that we got our seeds from too, and um, what was the other one? There was a another one that was really great, um, but I can I can drop it in the chat if I find it because there are so many different seeds like um, and also every spring the uh, I believe it's the biodome at Montreal they have a bunch of different um, uh, vendors that uh, present uh, their like all their seeds that they have so I don't know if, I don't think this year they had it in person they had it virtually but like yeah look out like every spring for um, you know the planetarium and biodome they they have like all of the different vendors uh, attending, but yeah, I'll go find the the name of the seeds that I uh, that I was thinking of, and I'll put it in the chat. That's a great tip. I had no idea that the biodome and uh, Espace pour la vie that they offered that. Yeah, they do. It's great. That's wonderful. Uh, we've got another question. How do I protect the containers on the balcony during winter? And so this is something that's also in the guidelines, but uh, yeah, what would you say to that, Andrea? Yeah, that's what I, I was mentioning before is that I would uh, probably bring it in, um, if you have a, a basement that is cold or coldish in the dark, um, I would try that. That would be my suggestion. It was interesting when we were researching for this workshop because I admit that in the past I assumed that you should just bring your plant indoors to your regular space. So I had a hardy hibiscus plant, so a hibiscus, but that survives in our ecozone. And um, I took it inside to my bedroom and kind of expected it to be okay. And it didn't really come back <laughs> next year. And when I was researching and finding out that they actually, they want you to, to to cold winter it. They want you to keep it protected from the elements, but in a cold space. So that's why they're recommending things like a garage or a cellar, like you're saying, or a, like a garden shed. Um, so it's important, isn't it, that your plants actually do get cold over the winter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm putting the guidelines in again uh, for people to download, and we have a tiny bit more info on how to do it. So you were saying you can either bring them inside to a cold space or you can leave them outside but cover them you would trim them right you would trim the flowers um, mm -hmm. just you very very short and then you bring them in a cold space okay okay that's great so it's just about getting to the end uh, and oh, Faye just gave us her her link too. So everyone, if you haven't been paying attention to the chat, uh, make sure before you leave to uh, maybe copy paste some of these links if you're interested in looking at them. And we'll also uh, be sending some of these out later on when we send our email out to our participants today. Um, but there's definitely some great resources here from our from our guests, from our speakers. Um, unless there are any other questions or comments, what are you going to plant this year, Andrea? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, <laughs> I have, um, tomatoes, obviously. Um, I, just, I, I love tomatoes and people laugh sometimes like, why are you growing so many tomatoes? I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> 
thing I have. <laughs> and you know why? Tomatoes also grow so long in the fall. Like till October, you have like, you're still picking tomatoes, like unless there's a frost. But so yeah, it's like it grows all summer. So I think tomatoes are amazing and they taste amazing. Um, so I have uh, cucumbers, not yet. I will plant those directly in the soil. Um, I'm gonna have, uh, I started uh, eggplant. I started peppers, kale, broccoli. Oh yeah, I'm very excited about the broccoli. <laughs> Is it your first time with broccoli this year? No, last year I bought seedlings uh, of broccoli and it, I think broccoli is amazing because it's like a flower, right? But it, mm -hmm. and it grows from this little seedling to like a tree trunk, like it's a small tree, but it is very uh, hardy. It's like the, 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 the stem of the broccoli gets really woody. Um, mm -hmm. I just think it's fascinating. Sorry, I get very enthusiastic <laughs> about this stuff. <laughs> I have cabbage, I have rainbow chard, um, leeks, leeks is the first, I'm trying leeks. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks funny, it looks like a piece of grass right now, and at first I, I was wondering, like I couldn't, I forgot to label it, so I was like, what is it growing, <laughs> did I plant grass? Uh, and I happen to not like grass, um, so I was, you know, a bit puzzled. Um, yeah, so that's <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, if uh, for anyone who hasn't taken a walk at the Loyola campus over the summer yet, I encourage you to go because it's really something to see Andrea's garden. It's it's just a bounty, just a full bounty of of growing vegetables. It's really quite amazing and very beautiful. And pollinators do go to some of those plants too, right, Andrea? Oh, oh yeah, all summer. Um, I, I have, you know, sometimes you gotta be careful because you wanna pick uh, vegetables, but you have to be careful. There's lots of bees in there. Uh, mm -hmm. It does unfortunately attract also like beetles that are not so welcome in a vegetable garden. Uh, so you need to control um, pest control uh, mm -hmm. from flies also, but yeah, you need to, you, you need to manage. Um, you know, that's the difference between the pollinator garden and the yeah. vegetable garden is the pollinator garden you're like come come in a vegetable garden <laughs> well i want them to come i need the tomatoes to be pollinated I yeah. need the cucumbers to but be you don't want them to eat your yeah i need the zucchinis but the thing is that the the pollinators are often not the ones that are uh eating the plants or damaging the plants so mm -hmm. there it's two different impacts Oh, so that, I, yeah, that's absolutely right. You mentioned yeah. beetles, and I was like, now I know that. Beetles well, there's, yeah, different kind of like the cucumber beetles, okay. Japanese beetles, those are really very damaging. There's, yeah, yeah like, yeah. Um, yeah, and also I'll be looking for volunteers. Uh, so, to, you know, the, the way the garden works is you, um, you need to register uh, to volunteer. Uh, and um, so you could work about an hour and a half, two hours a week, and then you benefit from the harvest. Um, yeah, as, as a group. So that's, that's fun because a lot of us don't have access to land. Uh, and, and especially if uh, students who are living in apartments, it's, they don't, you don't you often have access to a backyard to grow a garden mm -hmm. or to grow a variety, a wide variety of vegetables. So it's kind of fun to, uh, a, learn to grow food, grow your own mm -hmm. food, and B, to benefit from the harvest and, and save some money uh, at Yuda from the grocery store. Um, somebody's asking uh, where it, the garden is situated at the back of the campus, off Terrebonne. Uh, if you know where the Vanier Library is, there's a big parking lot there. So I'm right at the back of the parking lot. Uh, next to the psychology building and the residence. So in that general area. Yeah, but if it's summertime, you can't miss it because yeah. if you're just walking that way, uh, you go towards the back, follow that parking lot and you'll, you'll see it for sure. So uh, thank you. It's about time to wrap up, but I'll make sure that when we send out our resources and our links, that I'll include that uh, volunteer sign up link that you mentioned. Um, so, 
I just want to say thank you, Andrea, for this. This has been really amazing. Your knowledge really shines through and your passion for, for planting is, is, is obvious. And it's been very useful to have you here and talk about this because as much as we can research these things on the internet, sometimes there's no substitute for talking to someone who, who actually does it. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, thank you also for the Concordia pollinators and our Center for Creative Reuse members uh, for visiting and, and talking with us today. It's been you, very helpful to have you here too. And finally to the fourth space for hosting us. This has been a really great event and we're happy that we had uh, so many people participate. So final thank you to the audience and your participation for coming here today and for wanting to learn about this and for doing your part because if all 30 of us here today actually plant our pollinator gardens, that's 30 more gardens that are going to be available in Montreal for our pollinator species. Um, so thank you. I will leave it there and I'll post a link to the Living Planet at Campus uh, web page if you're interested in learning more what that is and what it's all about. So thank you. I'll leave it to Doug if you wanted to come on and say a final couple of words and end our, end our event. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you. And it was just a, just a perfect, perfect day for this to get started. And thanks for everybody for coming out. Um, links are in the channel. We'll get the recording up later today for anyone that wants to follow back through it. And uh, have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Enjoy the weather. Thank you.